All right, here with Nathan Adrian. Uh, appreciate it, mate. Thanks for joining us. Oh, man, thanks for having me. Yeah, this is super cool. We get a chance to talk to an Olympic champion in the 100 freestyle. Um, a lot of people have heard my comments and and listened to me speak, but I've never been an Olympic champion, and, and especially in the 100 freestyle. So to have one sitting here, um, it's a great honor, my friend. Man, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um you were watching just like I was watching and uh, I think initially when we first all saw the race it was it was it was very shocking it was like wow what a performance I mean um, what, what was your first initial um, reaction to what you were seeing in this hundred freestyle <laughs> that's funny you say that um, my first response as i was watching live you know yeah you have these like motor neurons in your brain uh mm. that kind of like you can kind of feel these things when you're watching them mm. um i felt what it felt like to go out in a 22 low and mm. that like <laughs> the anxiety and and anticipation of what the last 15 meters feels like when you do that actually kind of hit me i got these butterflies in my stomach from it <laughs> um but he he didn't experience the same pain train that I would experience in the last 15 meters. Obviously, that's where he really pulled ahead. Um, so it was a different different race in in, in that manner. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I was just absolutely in shock, especially like, you know, I, I was always a big um, I, I would always be, I was pretty vocal about, you know, turning the pools like the the pool uh filtration off and and trying to get like the deepest pools possible mm. you know if we could do double lane lines or even let the uh let the winners of semifinals choose their lanes so they could be in the outside lanes or something um because the 100 free in my opinion is the event that is affected the most um by big waves in a pool um, and that's because you got the guys that like the 50, obviously they're going to generate the biggest wave because they are the biggest, strongest, and they're moving the fastest, but they don't have to go back through it. <laughs> um, in the hundred, you have to figure out a way to go back through it. And, and the nuance to that is that every pool's wave hits you like slightly differently. And for me, it was between five and six kicks off the wall. Like mm. sometimes five kicks was enough to get under the wave. Sometimes six kicks was what I needed to do. And sometimes I'd go six kicks and, and then I'd still come up and I'd, I'd feel something like I'd hit something, um, I don't know where it was, maybe like 12 meters or something. And, and it would, it would kind of mess my, mess up my rhythm. Um, so to be able to do it in a pool like that, uh, where the, obviously the waves were big, um, is impressive. Yeah. Yeah. It, look, this, this swim has changed the way that we have to think about the hundred freestyle. I mean, we, we knew from previous years, you know, 2009 when the super suits were around and and we saw someone get under 47 for the first time, we knew, okay, that's that's the new shift here. We, we have to start to think about swimming 100 freestyles under 47 seconds. Now, it's almost like we have to start thinking about swimming under 46 if we want to get, get close to this world record because if we don't, if we're just thinking about creeping under 47, we'll never get anywhere close to this world record this 46 four is has really shifted um the way that we're going to have to think and and even train for this event right yeah absolutely and i think actually that's a good point um I, I think with the 2009 era there was a shift to being able to go out swimming a really fast connected sprint mm -hmm. type stroke Right. Um, and then being able to hang on and maintain it. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, the last two hundred freestyle world record holders are swimming. I mean, they're 200 guys that are doing it. So they're, they figured out how to go 22 mid to low going out, uh, using more of like that hip driven stroke where the timing of your kicks are slightly different super high elbow, a lot less like, you know, power, uh, thinking more about like efficiency type swimming. Mm, yeah. And let's let's try and have a look at this. Uh, I'm going to try and pull it up real quick so we can look at it. Um, let's see how I do here. <laughs> I'll give it a go. Right. Uh, let's share the screen. Let's go pan up here. Share. You can see that. I can. Okay. All right. Take your marks. 
those other those other swimmers are, are right. effectively pulling them back. They're really fighting for the the water to fill in, like the the water that they displace. Right, you're moving through the water, and then the water has to fill in behind you, and they can like they're getting a little extra off of what he's doing, and it's it's helping them. That's why drafting exists and why it, why it works. Um, you know, fluid dynamics person yeah. could explain it a little better than me, but um, but he's he's breaking away, and that is something. Yeah. Especially, especially yeah. the last fifteen, that's just something that's incredible. Yeah, I've got some numbers on that. I want to talk to you about the specifics of the numbers. Um, just in terms of visually what you were seeing, is it, was there anything um, special, anything unique, anything, uh, you know, like game-changing that you were seeing in his technique? Um, really, for me, like I, I've seen that type of technique before I've, I've tried it a bunch but i mean i couldn't get close to going 22 to doing how it would you how would you feet. describe it then like for those that don't know freestyle or, or aren't you know don't exactly know what you're talking about what it, what is he doing that you're seeing that is that is challenging or or unique that or special it's to, him? to me and i haven't seen like high res like slow motion footage of this but it looks like his kick timing is just like slightly different he's got that little pause at the top where like you have that the kick on entry and then for me it was basically i would i would try to connect the top of my stroke to the next kick immediately so it would be mm. like opposite kick on entry and then i'd kick connect right away and and that way i would just try to kind of generate as much power and, and be a like power type swimmer speed type swimmer but try to do it as efficiently as possible to try to last over um over 47 seconds but he is doing it where it looks a lot more like a maybe like a 200 like short course um, type swimmer where there's a, just that little extra glide right there, and then mm. he's going to catch. Um, and and his kick is just, I mean, it's a, it's impressive. You you can see it if it, yeah. if it stands out in a field like that, like you know, it's right. something really special. Right. Yeah. I think that's the thing is that pe people don't fully appreciate that the kick the kicks the engine the kicks the thing that, that drives this boat you know and when you have an engine an outboard motor like that it's easier to stay a little bit longer out front and catch a little bit more water because it's it's almost like you're wearing a pair of fins you know when you when you wear fins we've we've seen ben proud on the internet for instance swimming slow motion arms with these this beautiful legs but he's got fins on the back and everyone's like he's got fins on it's like well yeah that those fins are driving that and so it's it's almost like pan looks like he has these fins on because he's able to extend and catch and hold that extension a little bit longer but he's also very flat on his on his head you you were similar in terms I was of thinking, I, I was just just going to go there too yeah. it, it is interesting because you do see um and I'm thinking about a lot, a lot of college college swimmers here. Maybe I'm just paying attention to a lot of college swimming these days. But mm. um, their heads are tilted up a little more um, mm. as they are going through the water. Uh, and that was a way that people were swimming for a while, and people were doing it pretty fast. Uh, but Pan's just – he looks like he's like straight parallel to the, uh, mm. to the ground. And he kind of does like a little – has that little hitch where it pops him up in the water to get his breath, and then he kind of like sinks down a little bit, pops him up, mm. gets him up just high enough to get that breath, and then sinks down a little bit. Yeah, you you were kind of a specialist at that of like breathing in this bubble. that You didn't yeah. – it almost looked like you didn't even take a breath. It's just like bubble, <laughs> head back in. Like what, what's the significance of, of – getting that head alignment for people that again that don't fully understand speed freestyle well you know for me i i like to think about it as like my body just like wants to be in this position to generate the power so i would i would get that breath get my head back in line and then like for a couple reasons one i'm just in a better position right here to actually generate the power at the top of my stroke before I, like i waste a bunch of if i if i lean on my breath i didn't have like the flexibility and strength to keep my hand in a good position near the surface of the water, I would always kind of sink down or I would get tired and I would sink down. And then all of a sudden my head gets back and then I lose, you know, six, eight inches of water at the top of my stroke. Um, the other thing that I think that like it's, it's subtle, but it's something that I certainly felt is that as I did it, I would rotate my head. I would get my, I would snap my head back pretty quickly. Mm. And so quickly that once I stopped it, I could kind of feel that like that momentum uh, make its way into my shoulders. So it was like, get that breath, head back. And then all of a sudden it stops. That has to go. That energy has to go somewhere. I would have it channel it to my shoulder. Boom, connect and continue with my stroke. 
Mm. You talk about the breath, and and it seems like swimming, especially, uh, I, I guess all hundreds, let's say, hundreds of of stroke and and freestyle. It was almost like we we had these breathing patterns where we would hold a little longer, maybe every four, every six, something like that. Butterfly every two. It seems like now we've gone into this shift of more oxygen is better. It looks like Pan is almost breathing every cycle. You know, butterflies are now breathing every cycle. Is there? Have you seen a shift in the way that we're approaching races by taking in more oxygen? That's a great question, man. I I, I think honestly, you might you might be a little better equipped to answer that than me. Um, I, what I will say is I I just in my own playing in the pool now just because I still love to swim, but I know I can't I can't possibly do the same things that I was doing when I was training full time. So. Mm kind of just keep it fresh and keep it interesting. I do different things. I'm doing like oxygen tables, like the kind of stuff that free divers are doing. Mm. And it's really fun and interesting to see how much you can improve your own CO2 tolerance. And I'm, I'm wondering why maybe I didn't do that a little bit more um, as an athlete during my time. And, and if I could have maybe yeah. taken a little less, less breaths. I mean, do you remember when Austin stabbed, mm what was it in 2009 or 2010 did the last 25 no breath and fly and everyone was like just oh mind blown that's incredible that's so cool and it's like people have done it since then but just like to be that first person to have like yeah Mm -hmm. just just like i don't know i i always love that because i i think that being the first person to do anything is, is really impressive and and he probably he probably was doing something along the lines of that or you know what what skip was having him do in the water was equivalent of doing his oxygen tables and, and swimming what was your uh uh breath um what, what's the what's the word i'm looking for like here? my breathing pattern <laughs> yeah exactly what's your breathing yeah i mean pattern? i would basically breathe and then i would i would just uh, at, at about 15 i would stop breathing and I'd, I'd switch to switch to straight arm i i got pretty good at being super efficient with that with my, i guess my like the way I approached it was uh, I want that oxygen and I would um, figure out how to make my breath more efficient as opposed to spending, I guess that's what I spent my time doing. Instead of, instead of developing CO2 tolerance, I, I yeah. developed an efficient breath. Oh, Probably right, should have yeah. done both. Yeah. I mean, well, I definitely would have had to do both now these days. But again, it seems like that's, that's what they're moving away to is more efficient breathing, you know, and, and they're, they're getting their breath and they're, and they're, um, you know they're staying in and uh, every cycle breath count type thing to get that oxygen and and which is looks like it's enabling them to to come home quicker but they're they in the in the hundred there's always that balance between you know the the front and the back right like we we talk about that and i think when we saw popovich break the world record for the first time you know i think six to eight swims in the lead up to that he was playing with that balance of like how fast do i go out how how can i come home in and get that balance right um, it seemed to me like Pan, you know, shifted the balance completely where it's like, I'm going to go out as hard as I can. I'm going to put, I'm going to put distance between me and everybody else. And then I'm going to hold on and I'm just going to keep charging that. That's a, a totally different shift in terms of the balance, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that's it. I mean, it's, it, it is interesting too. And just kind of like, I think that stat talking about with this is the first time ever that there wasn't a, a finalist in the hundred and the fifty at yeah. the Olympics. Is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, uh, I believe I mean, um, the the French swimmer uh, qualified but pulled out of the fifty. But ultimately, all eight swimmers who swam in the finals were completely different from the fifty to the hundred. The first time in in Olympic history. I, I think that is that is something that isn't getting the attention that it deserves maybe 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 actually you're you're giving it the attention that it deserves in the in the sprint training community um i think that's and what cam has done and i mean looking forward to if he i, I did he mention if he's going to continue swimming I, I hope he does oh yeah yeah he's definitely going to continue yeah for sure uh, um i mean that's that's been fun to see it's really fun to watch i mean even like i i well, Cam has figured out how to, um, and I'm going to say this in the nicest possible way. Cam has figured out how to do the bare minimum in the water to get the maximum result, 
right? So like when I say bare minimum, I mean I'm talking volume of of work, right? Like traditionally, yeah, we go in and we swim five six k. Cam has figured out, hey, I can go in and swim an eight hundred and get the quality of the work that I need and get the performance that I need in the training pool and then stack those on top of each other and then swim faster than anybody in the world. So that, that's what he's figured out, you know? And Brett, you and I are speaking the same language here because we understand this. And like, I think that there's, that's something, um, 800 is broken up over what I, I like two hours, you think? Like he's still mm -hmm. spending the time at yeah. the pool. Right. Like, you don't what people don't realize is like hey we just swam at 25 fast oh i'm all pissed off i'm gonna do it again i'm gonna go i'm gonna go fast enough it's like no, no like realistically you're you like if you want to go max 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 speed we're talking like it's rest but if you really 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 want to do it well it's like probably like 12 plus sec minutes of rest like right. and again cam's yeah. got the physiologist um yeah. at his disposal to actually discuss those like recovery times but cam is like, the physiologist by the way yeah yeah so it's it's like what people don't understand is like yeah. the amount of mental resources that go into that single 25 or whatever right. that particular effort is like you in, unless you've done it and you've done it like on a watch like even even for me too like i'll just i'll go some fast 25 is great but then like right it doesn't feel right it doesn't feel fast like the time on the clock isn't like it, it's not there but like in my mind i'm like i'm going 100 percent, but I didn't prepare a hundred percent for that effort. So it's like, okay, now I got to go do a bunch of deep breathing exercises, go rest, relax that three to five minutes. And then I got to spend another minute getting my mind into the right place and mm -hmm. like activating all these like little core muscles that I haven't used in forever mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. and doing it again. And all for what? Nine seconds. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> it's like, it's really intense, like, yeah. really intense. And, you just if you get that negative feedback of like doing it and then failing of like going slower for whatever reason like you hit a wave or you just like your whatever for whatever reason your dolphin kicks were more powerful you messed it up and you didn't hit your turn and then you get this negative like feedback of being like oh crap i wasn't as fast like that's hard man like mm -hmm. that was 20 minutes of your of your two hour effort or your two hours of being at the pool uh spent on a a 25 I, I just really don't i i don't think most people that aren't sprinters or haven't like yeah. done the 50 at a really high level could possibly understand um like how how taxing that is because if you're if you're a foreigner i am or you you're just like man i'm pissed off i'm gonna do more <laughs> and right, like you right. get this yeah. physiological benefit from it yeah. Uh, yeah and that's a beautiful thing and i i personally cannot do that so yeah. I'm not trying to suggest one is like harder than the other. I'm just saying what well, the sprinting part is super hard too. So, yeah, there's definitely been a shift, right? So the, the 50 speed work, you know, the Ben Prouds, the flow managers, I mean, they're, they're cutting down on the yardage. Their quality is jacking up. They're getting strong and fast and powerful. Um, they're doing a lot of resistance work in the pool, outside of the pool. Um, and, and there's been the shift, right? Even, even, even if we look at, um, Sarah Sostrom, you know, over 30, you know, has, is just dominant in the speed events now. I mean, I think she surprised herself in that 100, but she she's just one of those people that can perform under under pressure. But I think she, she now sees herself as this 50 swimmer. So I, I do think there's going to be this shift away, uh, or not away, but a separation between this, the 50s and the 100s, especially if they bring the 50s into LA. We're going to see a major shift of people focusing there. Going back to the hundred and what we what we saw with Pan and and what he did, and knowing the training that it takes and and the training that you did to get your win at the Olympics, how do you uh, man? How did you manage the balance? Because we don't know what Pan did specifically, but I imagine it's a lot of work. How did you manage the balance between finding enough speed and finding enough endurance? Oh man, that's a question for Dave. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dave, Dave, he's the man with a plan. Um, he, he, you know, and it started when I basically walked walked down the campus in 2008 in the fall, um, and then you know us getting to know each other, swimmers, swimmer and athlete, and then and then him kind of figuring out like I was I was a little bit of a unique swimmer when when it comes to being able to like go pretty fast in season, and my taper was like just a slightly different. Mm. Um, so 
you know, the, the song and dance, Brett, you know, you know it well, freshman year, you're going to mm -hmm. kind of give everyone the same taper and then you're going to have to evaluate like who, you know, needs what differently, like throughout those years. And, you know, he, he got it down to a, to a science with me. How old were you when you won in London? 23, 23. So you, so you were just out of college, but you've, you've done your four years and you, and like you mm -hmm. said, you've played, you've done this song and dance for a number of years to, to the point where now you've, you've got it where everything's firing for you specifically. You, you know what you need, you know how to do it. You know, you know what you got to do. So going yeah. into London, let's just talk about the, the training aspect to, to win this gold medal in the hundred freestyle. Um, what are the things that were working for you? What, what did you do well in that lead up to that hundred freestyle? Well, I think I, I worked a lot on that balance um, and, and through Dave's, Dave's sets, so just the way he designed them. And it wasn't like this, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like this architect of like these crazy different sets. It was just a series of back end fifties on different intervals. And like, and we would work on, you know, my stroke count to my, like my, my, um, God, I can't even remember the, my frequency. So like, it would be like, playing with that to figure out how I could hammer out three or four, you know, fifties going, you know, 23 low or, or sorry, sorry, 23 high or 24 low. Mm. Um, and, and do it with like feeling the easiest as, as possible. And then I say that, but I would, you know, kind of die on the last one, no matter what, but, um, mm. it was a lot of that. It was a lot of this mind game of, of playing, playing with that. I mean, we'll talk, talk, kind of talking about what David Popovich is doing. Like I did that a lot in practice every day. And like to the day, even different days, I would be like, Oh my, my dolphin kicks feeling good today. I'm going to throw in an extra kick. And he'd be like, okay, yeah, sure. Let's do it. Let's give it a try. And, and I would do it. And you know, we talked about it afterwards and if it worked, we'd love it. If not, it's like, no, eh, no, maybe, maybe it was just a false alarm. Um, so that was definitely a big part of it. I, I also needed a lot of flexibility um for to execute the stroke that i had like that i was comfortable with um so i needed to spend a lot of time in the training room getting active release or getting needles or or just getting you know massage taken care of um yeah my body responded really well to, to body wear cups we did a lot of cups right. um yeah so i i needed my when i get tired i mean my body just kind of like hunkers down um, and it'll, it'll tighten up on me and I'm naturally a pretty flexible person. But when I lose that flexibility, that's when like injuries and, you know, pain start to flare up. So I just spend a lot of time like stretching in the training room, you know, rolling on that lacrosse ball. I mean, everybody came in to weights at, at one o'clock. I mean, I was, I was in there at 1230 every day, just getting an extra half hour in there, getting, getting my mind right. Um, getting that extra, the flexibility work in there too. And that's the thing that we don't see, right? And, and you know, we see this performance of you in 2012 winning. We see Pan 24 winning, but we don't see the backstory. And, and especially with some of the Chinese athletes, we don't always get let in to see the work that they're doing. But Pan's obviously done the work. And, and you brought up before we started this interview, you brought up the fact that you, you, you watched an interview with Pan, you know, I think a, a week before they went into the uh, – the village and he, and he was talking to talk us through the, the interview that you okay. saw there. Basically it sounded like he was pretty confident that he could, he could break the world record and he was glad that he only broke the world record in Doha by, you know, a little bit and that his competition could only saw him go 46, eight and that it was his, I think he called it his smoke screen and he knew he was, uh, he was ready for a good one. He was like, he told the producers, he was like, but don't, don't show this. <laughs> until you know after the uh after the fact please mm. have you or did you feel that way in the lead up to to london did you feel like your preparation uh was was the best you'd ever put out there that was good enough to win uh, okay um i felt like we did everything that we could do um i wasn't sure that i was gonna win but i did know that uh everybody expected james to <laughs> because of how fast he went mm. um and because he was willing to accept that 
uh, like title as like the, the gold medal favorite walking into the games. Like I was really comfortable being there as part of team USA and just trying to, trying to get on the medal stand. Um, yeah. And, and, and through the, through that, uh, Olympic, like through those Olympics, I, I just gained more and more confidence every time I, I jumped in the water. Um, I do, I, I can't remember, but I, I think I popped under 48 for the first time leading off the relay and I might have beat him by a tiny little bit. So that's when that little, you know, that little spark in your mind starts to happen. Like, oh, like, oh, wait, like, yeah, he did, you know, at, at 2011, he was 47.4, I think. And then obviously there's trials, I think it was 47.1. Um, but, you know, he was, he went a 47.9, like, like, Hey, we went head to head and I think I, I got my hand on the wall first. So like it's, yeah. it's on now. Now there's very few people in history who have the unique experience to be able to say they're Olympic champion in the hundred freestyle. And that's why I'm, I'm loving talking to you today because look, when, when those eight swimmers lined up last week, I was, I was unsure of who was going to win this thing. I mean, uh, there was, there was talk and, you know, people were having their bets and people were putting in who their first, second, and thirds was. Even as they lined up and I'm sitting here live announcing it and talking about it, I had no clue who was going to win that thing. I had really no clue who was going to finish first, second, third, and who was going to finish last. I mean, to 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 think that um, it finished the way that it did, it, it would have been impossible to predict that. But But as they lined up, Every one of them had a chance, right? And and you're the only one who can tell us uniquely of like <laughs> when you line up against those people in that final, how do you get the best performance out of yourself in order to then become the winner, right? Like, there's only one winner, and <laughs> you were the one that did that. So how we how did you approach lining up in that race and then eventually winning that race? Um. Man, that's a, that's a totally fair question. I think I think the answer is is that everyone is slightly unique in how they approach it, or they should be at least slightly unique in how they approach it to figure out for them how they how to elicit that performance. Um, and and one of the stories I, I go back to is like I think Tom's freshman year. I, I don't remember what year it was, um, maybe twenty eleven. But he, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. If we were like we were, it just stretching, getting ready to to go up to our like mid season meet, and I was like, "What are you listening to?" And he goes like, uh, "What is he? Doing? Oh, he's listening to Jack Johnson." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> like he's like, "No, this is what I, this is what I need, man. It chills me out. It gives me my it gives me the Zen vibe that I need." And like that was a moment for me. It was it was a light bulb moment, but I didn't like appreciate it fully until like much later where I just realized like for me, I, I am a guy who kind of lives on like the the side of the spectrum where like I, I, I love a little bit of crowd noise. I love like if I need to use music to, to get me hyped up and, and ready to go, I'll use that music. Um, but for Tom, like I think I think sometimes he like he can be he can get too excited if he if he like mm. engages in the crowd noise or into like really intense music and it puts him in a place where, you know, peak performance isn't isn't going to occur. Um, so for me, actually, I, I can give you a little um, kind of my play by play of what I did before, because mm -hmm. I remember I didn't love uh, the vibes of the ready room. It was it was really intense, mm -hmm. um, as as you can imagine. Um, and just like <laughs> I was always jealous. The backstrokers always seem to have this cool vibe. Like I would ask Matt about it. Like, Dude, what's your guys' ready room like? He's like, I don't know. We're just a bunch of we're, – we're happy. We're cracking jokes. We're, we're having a good time. I was like, Dude, the hundred is not like that. <laughs> like, like Caesar is like really beating himself up, like really intensely. And mm. during that time, obvi like obviously Caesar was like, you mm. know, the, the the world record holder. So a lot of people started doing that. Mm. Um, some people were doing like really intense, like dramatic, deep breathing things, mm. like like mm -hmm. the entire time. And then like, you know, people like some of the other countries that weren't quite as social would just kind of like sit in the corner and like do the Michael, Michael Phelps face before it was like the Michael Phelps face and just like <laughs> stare you down. And like, mm -hmm. this is all happening in a very small room where not even kidding, the chairs are this far away, like mm -hmm. four inches away. These people are in your personal space. 
<laughs> like it's not like a comfortable place. So I actually asked the official, like, cause there's the first call room and then the second call room. I was like, Hey, there's room in the next call room. Is there any way like I could, I could go up there. Um, and I did, and it was actually, um, Kathleen Hersey and Camille Adams. I don't, I can't remember if it was their semifinal or their final, but, um, I sat there with them with a couple of my team USA teammates mm. and, um, and got to just kind of enjoy, enjoy. I mean, we were all super nervous, but like that, that was my Jack Johnson in, in that particular moment. It brought me down into a place of, of peak performance for myself. I did right. have to like, <laughs> like go through that second call room, um, you know, as, as the 200 flyers went out and did their swim and then the hundred freestylers moved back in, I did have to, um, you know, endure, <laughs> if you will, the, the intensity of that call room. Uh, but I abs always have, and I think I always will. And one of the reasons I have massive FOMO of not trying to figure out how to go to France because it was so loud, but the crowd noise is so fun for me. Mm. I loved it. Um, uh, even if it was for someone, I mean, it was, even if it was for someone else, I remember 2016, uh, stepping up onto the blocks and like them having to take a pause because the entire arena was chanting Bruno, Bruno, Bruno. <laughs> I mean, it was like, those are the moments in, in my, like in my mind that I look back to and I was like, that was so cool. That was so awesome. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I vibed off the crowd noise that would always give me a little something. And even now, like I don't have a crowd to watch me, but like, if I if I find some if I am swimming and I you know there's a coach on deck with a with a watch I have so much more accountable to a time when I'm like hey can you get my time on this mm. um, it just just gives me that little something extra to actually go fast that's cool great analysis then man I appreciate you taking us deep into that that uh, I I could feel all of that just as you were talking there and. Uh, <laughs> And it's, insane, it's insane, man. It's insane. It's insane. Okay, let's go. Let's go back for a second. George Bovell, a guy that we both we both know. I love yeah. George. I lived with him um, down in the Florida Keys, and he used to he used to just like talk about the 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 ready room, like oh, in the fifty freestyle ready room. He has this he has this island accent. He's from Trinidad and Tobago. There's testosterone dripping off the walls, and he's talking about <laughs> how it's like the jungle where you have to kill or be killed, and um, <laughs> it's it's. I'm not sure if I, I totally feel the same way, but like the fact is that if someone else does, like it puts off this certain kind of vibe of, of the mm -hmm. ready room. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and yeah. And, yeah. It, well, it going, back to, so, going back to, going back to this one that, that I saw, um, mm -hmm. when Pan came out, he actually was carrying his jacket and I said, Oh, Pan's carrying his jacket. That's a crucial mistake. And, and it turned out it wasn't a crucial mistake <laughs> at all, but, but he did say after the interview that, um, he was really hot in the ready room. He's like, I was overheating. And so I took my jacket off. And so that, that's an interesting, you, you know, you talk about, you know, performance and what it takes for you to like, normally you'd say, Hey, put the jacket on. Cause it looks super cool. He's like, no, I'm hot. I'm taking this thing off. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I felt that way. I, I was someone who always bundled up and bundled up and bundled up for those. I was like Reagan Smith, you know, rocking out pink mittens. Um, but those rooms can be really small and they have TV lights, <laughs> like just sit in a room with like a 200 watt light bulb with like, they're not optimizing for perfect airflow in the, uh, in the ready room, right? They're not, they don't really care about the athletes getting that oxygen. They care yeah. about getting the TV shot, um, mm -hmm. and fitting it into like a small area so that that's, it, it, it can get really hot and stuffy in those rooms. Yeah. Let's uh, let's talk about the numbers uh, real quick. I know we've been chatting a while, and this is good. Um, let's let's dive into the numbers a bit. I wrote down the free speed time. So I'm I'm talking about here. Here, there's um a, a ten meter a ten meter slot where it's fifteen to twenty five, and then the next twenty meters is twenty five to forty five, and then coming off the wall, it's sixty five to seventy five. That ten meter slot, and then the last twenty is 75 to 95. So I, I wrote down these four numbers. Let's let's compare the top three finishes here. So let's go with the first free speed of 10 meters. So you come out of that dolphin kick, out of your breakout, you go 15 to 25, 10 meters. The first, the first slot of 10 meters swimming here, Pan was 4.63, Kyle Chalmers was 4.78, and Popovich was 4.74. So the first piece of speed that they got into pan was already a tenth faster than more than a tenth faster than both those guys that's that's 
significant in itself, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So he, I mean, he gets up and he gets I'm going. I'm surprised that David was faster. Or, sorry, well, who is? Yeah, Popovich was slightly faster than, than Chalmers. He's faster Chalmers. than Kyle, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's impressive. Okay. Um, let's go. Actually, let, let, let's talk about uh, the splits themselves real quick. So Pop, Pan is out in 22.28 and, and back in 24.12. So 22.28, 24.12. Kyle's out in 23.03. Back in twenty four forty five, so he's he's back home three tenths slower than Pan, and Popovich out in twenty two nine, so a little bit faster than Kyle to his feet, but he's back in twenty two uh, twenty four point five five, so he's actually back a little bit slower than than Chalmers. Now, both of those guys are renowned for their back end. Obviously, Popovich has got the two hundred background, won the two hundred a couple of days earlier. Kyle is renowned to, for one of the the best closers in the game swims over the top of people obviously did that the past couple of Olympics coming home. So they're both 24, four, 24, five. I imagine that's not their best splits either, by the way, of coming home. I imagine the waves had some effect on that. What do you think? <laughs> I'm always going to give a hundred freestyle the benefit of the doubt when it comes to waves, man. <laughs> always, always, always. Um, and yeah. And honestly, you know what I was, what I would look at is look at like one of like, Katie swims where she's just like going through all that fresh water, but it's not fresh. Like you can, you can mm. see water that hasn't been moved through for a hundred meters and it's still just like mm. what's going, it's just, it's not clean. It's not clean water. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what does it actually feel like when you come off that wall and you're experiencing the waves? For those that don't fully understand, <laughs> it, what does that feel like? So I, I maybe I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to explain it like this. A lot of people have done positive chords, right? Um, you know, where you get pulled on a chord by a coach. Mm, and when right. you do a good job of having a good start, underwater dolphin kicks, you pop up, you time your breakout really nice. You get up on top of the water and then you can kind of like plane like a boat. And it feels like you're kind of getting pulled on a chord because it feels so nice and easy. That's mm. that's my memory of, um, of my 2012 swim. Um, and then when you, when you hit the wave, it, it, it feels like you're going through a wave. Like everybody's felt that before as someone else is swimming the other way, but you lose that plane and it almost feels like the coach just dropped your core. So everything mm -hmm. feels a little heavier. You feel a little slower. And then you feel like you're trying to figure out how to get back on top of the water. If you, if you kind of lost that, it's, it's really pretty, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good at all. No, it doesn't, and and especially if you if you cut your kicks a little short too. If you pop up a little quick, sometimes you can catch a hand on it and kind of knock you back a little bit. Sometimes it'll pop you up. Other times, like yeah. I said, it's sometimes it'll smash in your face and you'll get a mouthful of water. You lose an entire yeah. breath. Yeah. Like if you're luck, I mean, worst case scenario is you straight up choke. Like, but right. often there there were several times where I would I would get I try to do my quick breath and like just for whatever reason the crest of the wave was just too high that I couldn't create the bubble and I would just I got nothing. Did you notice the waves in this pool? Is this something that you could visually see? Um, oh man, I, I couldn't give you a I I need more I need I need to go back and look at different different pools, my favorite and my least favorite pools to uh But it wasn't something like you were looking at Paris and you were like, Oh, I can definitely see the wave there. Like you it wasn't that it didn't stand out that big, did it? I would say that the choppiness of the pool did a little bit. Maybe it was yeah. the lights though, but like it just didn't, it didn't calm down. It didn't, yeah. it took so long for the the water to be glass. And mm. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I, I, I felt like it had an effect. I could see it. And I, and I definitely felt like it had an effect on, on the field as well, which is why um initially when i when i commented on on pan swim it was very difficult for me to believe because of the fact that the waves were so big and and it, it affected everybody it just didn't seem like it affected pan at all it seemed like he was just in a glass pool and he was just riding on top of the water and maybe maybe it's like what you said maybe he got under that and maybe he did feel that effect of being pulled instead of hitting that wave maybe he felt that effect you know it could have been, I mean, any, any number of things he's, um, 
Man, I, I love it, but like I got some texts from really, really smart people asking if like there's like there's like this effect where you can, you know, man, you, we're gonna have to talk to them. It was uh, it was it was Ben, one of the uh, the people helping out with ISL, if you remember, uh -huh. right? But I mean, people are looking at this and being like, that was a shallow pool. Maybe it created this this type of wave that ships creating a channel that actually happens in front of them. So the other people helped create this wave that helped push him. Uh -huh. Awesome, right. awesome, awesome that we have yeah. mm. uh, brilliant minds working on that sort of thing. I, I love yeah. I love to, to hear it. That's a different theory. I like that. Okay, it's out there now. That's good. Um, yeah, all is. right, let's go back. So now we're talking, they, the head crosses the 25 and they go to 45. So this is a 20-meter swim into the wall from the 25-meter mark to, to the wall. This is this is interesting. So now pan is 9.55 seconds for that 20 meters. Um, Kyle is 9.94, so he's four tenths back in that in that slot there, and then you, the same for Popovich, 9.94. So Kyle and and David were exactly the same speed in that 20 meter slot from 25 to 45. Pan is uh, inevitably basically uh, effectively four tenths faster in that slot. That's fairly significant, right? It's fairly significant, man. That's a ton. Yeah, that's that's crazy that is so yeah. that's really that and then that's where that first 50 that's where that difference was made yeah so pan All is that swim pan yeah. is faster in both swims uh a tenth in the first 10 meter slot he's four yeah. tenths faster that's half a second in free swim speed pan is half a second faster than the two guys that got second and third now the other interesting thing here is that pan is swimming faster with less strokes so he goes out to the 50 and 30 strokes uh, Kyle is 31 and Popovich is 32. So it's 30, 31, 32. So Pan is going out fast. He's swimming fast and he's doing it with less strokes. So does, does that mean, like you said, he's, his legs are working? Does it mean he's just got a super efficient kick and a, and a really clean, efficient pull? I don't, I don't know. Like I said, I haven't seen like any really good slow motion footage of him over underwater from that interview. Uh, that, I, that I saw him talking about how, you know, his 46.8 was a smoke screen. I bet he's going to try to hide as much of the footage of him yeah. swimming as he, as he can, too. He seems to, you know, think that that really is his competitive advantage. How uh, did you do that then? How, how did you uh, particularly work on uh, length and speed, you know, getting out faster speed with, with greater length? I just found this sweet spot of like a 1.1 to 1.15, uh, even even as slow as 1.2 stroke rate um, would be the sweet spot where I felt like I was on top of the water. Any mm -hmm. slower than that, and I, I I wouldn't be, and it would it would I mean my quick breath wouldn't work. Like I was I was significantly slower. It's like it's like when you're talking about how. Um, like Ben and Flo do that slow motion, like freestyle. Like it's mm -hmm. it's beautiful. They can they can use the power of their legs and the like propulsion to keep themselves on top of the water. When you try to do that when you don't have fins, it's like possible. It takes a ton of balance, but like it's it, it's I don't know. It, it it you need to be going a certain speed to make it to make it work right. nicely. And those fins are what help help create that to make that connection happen. Um, so basically 1.15 to 1.2 was as slow of a stroke rate that I could have while staying on top of the water. But like I said before, too, we're talking about Pan doing like kind of a, a longer hip driven stroke, like more like what Michael Phelps used to swim like. Right. Um, so who's to say that they can't like swim a little bit more through the water as opposed to on top? I'm not sure I haven't taken a right. super close look. Now, one thing that's not going to show up in these stats here, and and maybe most people don't understand, there's a commitment to speed too. There's there's a commitment to the front end, right? And and watching Pan swim, he's certainly committed to the front end of this and and the speed of getting out. And that that is a mental commitment that I'm talking about. Um, explain to people what that really means of that that mental commitment. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was talking about at the beginning, man, where I felt the pain, you know, what, you know, the pain's coming and your, your brain and your mind has like this preservation, just like that's, that's everything. It, it's self-preservation. That's what our brains are wired to do. So like in order to achieve peak performance, you like your brain needs to kind of relax and trust that you're going to live 
and you're kind of pushing the boundaries of that when you're going out really fast and wanting to come back really fast too. So like, man, it's a, it's, it is a game um, where like the conscious part of your brain is like, I'm doing this and you're going to like, you're going to like it. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. And like yeah. the subconscious part of your brain being like, no, 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 please don't do this. This is like messing with my homeostasis. Like I want to, I just want to live. <laughs> um, so, and, and that's actually, I mean, that's kind of, it all, it all is so connected, man. It, it circles back to talking about like, like cam and getting the most out of 800 meters or whatever. It's like a lot of that work is so, is so mental so mental just convincing your brain even in a, even in a 50 just like you can still do this you can still do this you can still like do like have maximal maximal force like generation at 17 18 19 20 seconds of your of your 50 freestyle and like i mean that's where he pulled ahead right like he right. figured something out to to shut down that part of his brain that's like no no no, please stop please stop <laughs> he's like right. no no, no. Right. i'm going Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that, that mental commitment. And that I've been there. I'm sure you've been there where it's like, all right, oh, yeah. how, how fast do you want to push this, buddy? You know, well, like, Brent, I, I think that's a great that's a great point, too. We've both been there. And then, mm -hmm. like, there's only so much of your conscious of you being conscious that can affect it that day. Right. Mm -hmm. Like to be the athlete that you want to be, like a lot of things outside of your life have to go well too, right? And that's why the people always talk about sleep being so important, mm, like right. doing your like your breath work, everybody's doing ice baths and saunas these days, all like all those little components, like to try and just unlock that little, like just take your, take the governor off of, of off of that subconscious part of your brain that's slowing you down. Right, yeah, well said, yeah, very, very, very smart there. Um, it's so true because it's it's not just the stuff you do in the pool. It's it's all of it, and it's all encompassing. And this again, this goes back to maybe why we can't we can't box pan in to say this this performance was this or that. It's like we don't know. There's so many unknowns here of like what he's actually done to get this performance. So um, you got to take your hats off to him in that sense. Um, Absolutely. And my headphones just uh, just died on me. So if you oh, can you still hear me? Still good. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I got you. I got you. Can you hear me? I run here in just just a couple minutes, but um... all right. One more thing, I want to just uh, finish on here. So the the last the last uh, end of free speed here. So we got the sixty five to seventy five. Basically, all three guys were the same around nine uh, four four point nine high. Okay, so that that coming off the wall in that segment, you know where the waves are and breaking through and and hitting the speed they're basically all just under five seconds all three of these guys here's the big shift here nathan is 75 to 95 okay the last 20 meters and this is where pan just absolutely crushes guys he's 10.18 seconds 10.18 the other two guys are 10.44 and 10.47 so we're, we're talking about another three tenths he's accelerating away in the last 20 meters of free speed here that that's pretty incredible isn't it Oh no! Can you hear? Me? Yeah. So, what were you gonna say? So, I what just blows my mind is I know how fast David and Kyle are mm. <laughs> going. Their ten was a ten four that you said. Yeah. And then to go that much faster during that, I mean, that's just that's a feeling that I don't know. <laughs> that's uh, like right. that's just something something really special. Right. And again, to pull away because it. In the hunter freestyle, when you have those big bodies moving like that, there's there is going to be like a regression to the mean too because of like people ahead getting sucked back and then the people behind getting kind of pulled forward by that wave. Um, so for Pan to really accelerate through that wave, that last that last fifteen is just something. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's that that's the part that really shocked me the most is like our. our I understand if someone attacks and goes out like a rabbit and, and you got to chase them down. That's fine. You know, I think both Kyle and, and David kind of uh, maybe even assumed that was going to happen. But then to get to the 75 meter mark and see Pan actually pull away, that that was the most shocking part of the race to me. But it's just, I couldn't, like you said, uh, I've never experienced that. I've never felt that. I've never even really seen that of somebody attack that hard. You know, I think of a Santo Condorelli in, uh, in Rio where he goes out, I think he was like out in 21, nine to his feet. And then obviously just, 
felt it, you know, and, and, and those guys swam over the top of him. So that's what I've experienced. But for, for Pan to pull away in that last 20 was just completely shocking. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, I, I completely agree. I felt the, I felt the, felt the uh, piano on the old back and Vlad was, Vlad was another guy in 2013 that went out really fast with me. Mm. Uh, he was out faster than I was. And then he had, he, he was hurting the last 15 of, of that one in Barcelona. What does it do to your body? Just tell us the piano. What is what is the feeling of what it does to your body? <laughs> it's it's your body. It just stops working. You think, but your nervous system is just like, nope, not gonna. I'm not gonna move anymore. You're like, I have spent my entire life to system to executing this stroke, and then all of a sudden, it looks like you're an age grouper, or it feels <laughs> like you're an age grouper, and like you can't actually bend your elbow, and you're just kind of like swimming, like throwing your hand over the water hoping that you're actually catching water attempting to use your lat pulling through um no it's a it's it's a it's tough it's tough yeah uh okay just last question before you go and i appreciate you doing this has been awesome um if you were still swimming uh, as some of these guys are and, and they're looking towards the future they're looking towards la are you thinking I, I can never get there. Uh, Forty six four is just impossible. I'm not. I'm not even going to aim for that. I'm going to. I'm going to try and be forty seven flat and and hope for a medal or hope for a, a bad performance. Or are you as an as an athlete, Nathan Adrian? Are you thinking, okay, that's the new norm. I'm I'm going for a forty six mid now. Ah, oh, Brett, man, you read my mind. I was literally no matter what that question was going to be, I was going to end with telling every young swimmer right now uh, to believe that they can do it. Um, mm. And whether it's like a young, like a young, young swimmer, like 10, 12, 14 years old, or it's like those who, who might be like heading into college and, and, you know, really hitting weights and some really specific training these days, you got to believe, I don't, I mean, you just have to, there's, I, I personally would have, I think I, I would have just lost motivation if I didn't have like some serious belief in like my own ability and, and like that the next swim was going to be the, the best one. Right. Um, that's, I, I think I just needed that as, as an athlete and, and we have seen someone, we've seen a human do it. So, uh, so why not, why not you, um, whoever, whoever you may be. And uh, LA in 2028 is going to be, unbelievable and we're going to watch some uh some incredible american performances i'm sure of it um we just need that generation of athletes to start dreaming and, and believing in it like right now maybe like next yeah. week actually but like <laughs> really soon <laughs> well said man and there's no way that you become who you are if you don't think that way and that's that's cool to hear that and it's cool to to pass on that advice um so man this has been awesome uh yeah, thanks for doing this. This is this is great just to break it down and just talk freely, you know. So yeah, sure. man. Thanks for having me. I would love. I mean, so just like I think for what about like for you, right? Like, what was what was winning and well, no, Clem went like forty eight one, right? And two was it two mm thousand? -hmm. Yeah, two thousand. Yeah. Right, but like, didn't you kind of feel the same way about like a forty seven one? You're just like, dude, what? That's crazy. Like we were doing everything that we could, and someone just went a full second faster than that. Okay, no. So 2000, Klim broke the world record, yes, and leading off the relay. But a few days yeah. later, Peter van den Hugenbank comes out and goes 47.8, becomes the first man under 48. Um, right. I think at that time I was shocked, <laughs> pretty much like I was when I saw the 46.4. But uh, yeah. but then but then you realize, okay, that's the new norm. We're we're going 47 from now on. You know, so. Agreed. Yeah. And like and like for you too. And, and I I actually I like asking people this, and we're good. I'm totally gonna be late to my next meeting, but. Um, like, don't you think that you, if if you internalize the fact that you needed to be faster right. in order to make the Australian national team or make top eight at the Olympics, right. you could have done it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I always, <laughs> right? I always Isn't that people, crazy? Nathan, I tell people this all the time. My goal was to swim in the final at the Olympics, and I think to, I think back to myself now, and I think, why wasn't my goal to get on the podium at the Olympics? You know, like, yes. damn it, you know, so. Yes. So oh, I think right. that's that is one of the coolest things because our ceiling is still so high. I mean, you saying right. you saying bolts like nine point five eight is still just like gonna blow everybody yeah. out of the water for a right. while, right? right? But like we are still setting world records. I think that's why swimming is so much fun. Yeah. Well, congratulations to Pan Zen Lee for uh, shifting the way that we think and 
and winning the gold medal. And thank you for doing this today, mate. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Take care.